Last year, I made a video showing how to set up a basic automated spaceship. In this video, we're going to see something from the other end of the spectrum, as I take a look at the thoroughly complex and powerful spaceship design Mark has created for our space exploration and Crastorio run. These ships are designed to run between an outpost, which provides a resource, and a central drop-off point, in our case Norvis Orbit, and to be flexible, so we can use the same design for all our routes with as few tweaks as possible for each new run. They will also take supplies to the outposts for those awkward recipes which require inputs other than just the appropriate ore, which is almost all of them. This is going to be a relatively advanced video. I'm not going to explain every single combinator, but I'll talk about the concepts of how everything works. If you have any specific questions, either ask them in the comments, come along to the Discord server, or join us for a K2SE stream and I'll show you how things work in a bit more detail. Throughout the video, I will use this beryllium ship as an example. Beryl requires sulphur, cryonite and vulcanite to be taken to the outpost to allow beryllium to be brought back, and as such is one of the simpler exotics, however the same principles apply to any logistics ship. Let's start off by taking a look at the ship, since it's the simplest part of the whole system. As you can see, the storage area of the ship has been made as narrow as possible around the warehouses. Because we're playing with Crastorio 2, we have the superior long inserters, and so with this ship design, we can pass resources in and out of the ship from inserters on the outside of it at a decent speed. If you don't have the superior long inserters, you could make the ship a little bit wider and use underground belts, and either loaders or stack inserters, depending on what's available. However, a belts and inserters system would be significantly slower, which is why I messed around with spaceship trains in my previous game. Underground belts and loaders would be quicker, but would be very lossy, as each time the ship leaves, any items on the underground belts would be lost. This design could be technically improved slightly by moving the loading inserters to inside the wall, however this would complicate the wiring a little bit, and more seriously, would spoil the pleasing symmetry of the ship. The ship's inventory, including the fuel level, is carried by a green cable which goes to the right hand spaceship clamp, and then off to the external circuitry which controls the ship. Inputs are brought in by a red cable from the left hand clamp. You don't actually need to have two separate clamps here, a single clamp can carry both colours of cable, and in fact a single cable could carry signals both ways, but a previous version of this design used more cables in order to provide extra functionality, and having the two clamps gave a pleasing symmetry, so we've kept them. There is a single constant combinator on board the ship, which tells the ship which clamps to attach to when it arrives at a destination, but all other configuration is done externally. Now let's take a look at the outpost spaceport. This is where the ship will unload anything required to make the main resource, and any random bits and pieces required to keep the outpost running. It will also be loaded up with everything the outpost produces and doesn't want. This will include the main resource that the outpost is supposed to produce, perhaps beryllium or holmium, and also any byproducts such as stone or the ores from core chunk processing. We don't know what ratio these are going to be produced in, so we can't tell the ship to depart when it has a certain amount of a resource, and also we don't want anything to be hard coded if we can avoid it. This design is supposed to be as general purpose as possible. So let's start by looking at how the ship gets loaded and unloaded. On the left hand side, the mixed resources arrive from the outpost and flow into the bottom of this warehouse to then be released evenly up to the other three warehouses. There's a circuit condition set on the belts to only run when there's at least a small amount of stuff in the first warehouse. This ensures that the other three warehouses will be filled evenly, ensuring that you don't end up with all your resources going into the same warehouse and delaying the ship's departure. Any items passed up to the warehouses are reported to a memory cell which keeps track of everything which has gone through. A nice side effect of this is that you can see ev absolutely everything which has ever been transported by the ship, as you can see on this real world example, but the real reason it's there is to prevent the unloader on the other side from immediately pulling these items straight back out again. We achieve this by multiplying this stored signal by minus one and adding it to the ship's inventory that's being output on the other side. This total can then be fed into the unloading inserters as a filter on the red cables. The resources which have been loaded will be cancelled out by the signal from the memory cell, but anything else on the spaceship which has been brought out from Norbit will not have a cancelling signal, and so will be unloaded into the right hand warehouses. This signal will have a very large negative number of the resources which get shipped, but that's not a problem. Negative numbers don't get applied as filters, and this is easier than resetting the memory cell at the right time for each ship. 
This means that we can send absolutely anything we want in either direction without having to program anything in this part of the design. The only proviso is that we can't ship anything out which we have at any point shipped back, but as long as we plan ahead sensibly we should be fine. So everything from Norbit will be unloaded into the warehouses on the right hand side and passed into the single bottom warehouse. From here, filters on the output loaders separate all the different resources out so they can be sent to where they're needed. Elevator cables to the elevator, train batteries to the train, meteor defence ammo to the guns, and resources such as vulcanite or sulphur to the, to the train to go down to the planet to be used in processing. Now that we've dealt with getting the resources on and off the ship, it needs to be sent on to its next port of call. The first thing to mention is over on the left where we have a combinator which always sends the next destination to the ship's console. Doing this separately from the launch signal is worth it because it means that the ship always knows where it's going next so you can launch it manually if you want to without having to faff around with the destination. The system is designed to be automated but especially early on you might not want to wait for a full load and decide it's worth sending the ship off a bit early to get your next stage kickstarted or because you've run out of something for making the main resource and need to tweak the numbers. For the automated departure we have a system of checks. In this case, we have four checks which need to be satisfied for the ship to leave. Each one outputs a green tick when it's ready, and these are fed to this decider combinator. When it sees all four, it sends the launch command and the ship will depart. The first tick comes from watching the loading inserters. Each of these inserters sends a pulse signal whenever it picks something up, and these pulses reset a counter below the warehouses. When this counter gets to 300, that means no inserter has started moving anything for 5 seconds, which means that they can't put anything else into the ship. This could mean that the input warehouses are empty, or it could mean that the ship is full. Of course, if the ship is full, it might still be clogged with supplies from Norvis, but we'll get to both of those points. The second tick comes from watching the loading warehouses. If there's more than 100 items in the warehouses, then we reckon that they're not empty, therefore, if the inserters are idle, the ship must be full. Technically, we should probably be checking each warehouse separately, but with the balanced loading, this is close enough, and if a ship leaves 99% full instead of 100% full, it doesn't really matter. The third tick comes from the other side, and is similar to the first one. However, unlike for the loading, where we use the pulse read mode, here we're using hold. This is because we don't want to know when the inserters are idle, we want to know when they're empty. If we watch for idle, we could get a false positive due to the output warehouses being full and the inserters not being able to empty their hands. This signal is fed out down the green cable to another timer circuit, so that when none of the inserters have been holding anything for at least 5 seconds, we can pass another tick over. The fourth and final tick is something we added to the design a bit later than the rest, because we were having problems with spaceships leaving prematurely. This problem is caused by the rate signals propagate through the circuit network. It takes one tick for each combinator to react to a change of input. This means that when a spaceship landed, it would take a few ticks for the system to realise that there was something for the inserters to pick up, and that there was space for them to load into. To fix this problem, we have a timer that watches for the docking signal from the ship. Once that's been seen for 1800 ticks, or 30 seconds, it outputs that final green tick. So, in the end, we get four confirmation signals. The ship can't be loaded, there is stock to load into the ship, everything that should be unloaded has been, and the ship has been here for at least 30 seconds. When all of these are green, the ship will be sent the launch signal and will head off to the next destination. The final thing to note in this design is the shopping list. This is the supplies that the ship should be bringing with it from Norvis and is configured in this combinator. Here we can set the supplies we would like to see as negative numbers. This is added to the total in the warehouse and then transmitted back to the home port so we know what's needed. This does also need another transmitter down on the planet to signal what resources have already been taken down, and there is a chance of problems if you have multiple ships doing the same route, but it's a nice simple starting point. The spaceport at the other end works very similarly. The spaceship lands in the middle, unloads everything it's carrying, loads up with the resources required at the other end. The big difference here is that the ship is only loaded with specific resources and in specific quantities, rather than just taking everything the outpost is producing. These requests are brought over from the outpost to a signal receiver at the top here, and then passed on in various different ways. Firstly on the left, we add zero to every signal. This is our standard way of isolating a part of the circuit network, so we don't accidentally feed signals back in and end up with mixing them up. 
This signal, which you'll remember is the negative of what the outpost is requesting, is then added to the contents of the four loading warehouses and passed down to the belts which feed the resources in. Each one of these is set to run when the signal for its specific resource is less than zero, meaning it'll run until the warehouses contain everything the outpost is asking for. This means that when the ship lands, everything will be ready to load in as quickly as possible, rather than having to wait to bring everything in along a single belt from a potentially unreliable supply. It also means that when the ship is docked, you'll have double the resources stockpiled, with one set in the ship and a second set in the warehouses, but this doesn't really matter. Back up at the top, the second cable coming out from the receiver has its signal negated, that is, multiplied by minus one, and is fed to the inserters to set their filters to make sure that everything the outpost is requesting gets loaded. To ensure that inserters stop when the ship has everything it needs and the ship doesn't get overloaded, this cable also connects to this arithmetic combinator, which is multiplying the ship's inventory by minus one and adding it on. So as the ship fills up, the requests get reduced until they reach zero, the filters are removed from the inserters and loading stops. The other two combinators at the top take all signals coming from the receiver, normalise them to one, whether they're positive or negative, and then multiply them by minus 10 million, giving very large negative numbers for every signal coming from the outpost. These are then fed to the inserters which unload the ship to ensure that requested resources are never taken back out again. It deals with both positive and negative numbers in case there's an overrun at the other end due to the ship delivering more than it should have on its previous trip or due to the requests being changed. These large negative numbers are added to the ship's inventory which cancels out any items which were requested by the outpost and then loaded into the ship. When fed to the inserters as filters, this ensures that only the cargo brought from the outpost is unloaded. The cargo is passed on to the shared warehouse which sorts the various types of cargo as appropriate. The main resource comes out of the top up to the station where it can be taken away by a train to wherever it's needed. Dead train batteries and scrap are passed out onto the disposal belt to be recycled and anything else goes into the other station to be taken down to Norvis to be sorted, processed, recycled and so on. We've used inserters here instead of loaders because it allows us to use filters to unload absolutely anything except the main resource, batteries and scrap. Crastorio loaders don't allow blacklisting or programming via circuit network. Lastly, the outpost will send an S signal for ship whenever there's a ship docked. At this end, we monitor for this signal and turn these lights on whenever the ship is in transit to give an idea of what's going on. This works nicely with a single ship, but if you have multiple ships on the same route, the lights only come on if all ships are in transit. Triggering the spaceship to depart uses a very similar system to the other end. As before, we're always feeding the, in the destination to allow for easy manual departures, and then we have a list of checks, each outputting a green tick to declare the ship ready to go. Here, the three ticks are, firstly, making sure the signal on the loading inserters filters is less than or equal to zero. This ensures that the ship has picked up everything on the shopping list. We don't expect the ship to be full on departure, because all the on-site processing produces more product and byproduct than it requires in supplies to produce it, not including the main ore, of course. So, the ship must be able to fit everything requested in, and so it'll fly out partly loaded, and then return full. Secondly, we check for more than 36,000 ion stream, meaning that the ship is 90% fueled. We don't want to wait for 100% because Factorio's fluid mechanics means that you'll probably never get there, and 90% is plenty of fuel anyway. Thirdly, we monitor the hand infantry of the unloading inserters. Like with the outpost spaceport, when there's nothing in their hands, and there hasn't been for 300 ticks, or 5 seconds, then we know that the ship must have finished unloading because the inserters haven't been able to pick anything up. When all these checks pass their ticks over, we know that the ship has finished everything it needs to do here and is ready to depart. So we pass in a launch signal and it can head off again back to the outpost. We don't have anything monitoring for how long the spaceship has been in port at this end. It's not needed as in normal use the ships will be low on fuel, full of supplies and not have satisfied the shopping list when they arrive, so they won't accidentally trigger and depart. Mark has been kind enough to create blueprints for all the ships with very clear instructions for configuring them, which means that even I can get these spaceships running. Each instruction has a number, with a corresponding number on the blueprint showing where it applies. The system is designed to be as general purpose as possible, but that means there are still a few things that need to be configured. Let's start with the outpost spaceport this time. Firstly, we set the clamp to have the ID that we've chosen for this route. 
This number allows the ships and all of their routes to be told apart. For example, we might set the Beryllium planet to have a clamp ID of 10, meaning the clamps in both spaceports and the clamp setting on the ship should all be 10. Vulcanite might be 20, Cryonite 30, and so on. Next, program this combinator with the ship's destination. This will probably be Norvis, and that's what's preset, but it can be changed if necessary. Number three is the outpost filters. This allows you to make sure that the elevator cable goes to the elevator, train batteries to the locomotive, sulphur to the planet, and so on. These are all set to a deconstruction planner by default to ensure that nothing gets passed through before the filters are set up properly. Next up, you need to configure all your inputs and outputs to whatever system you've built on your outpost. And finally, configure your shopping list as negative numbers in this combinator and set the transmitter channel. It's pretty straightforward, but without the list, it would be easy to miss a step. Now we're going to look at configuring the Norbit spaceport. There are a few more things to do here, but again, none of them are too difficult. We need to set the signal receiver to the same channel as we set the transmitter. We need to set the destination signal. This needs to be the right type of signal, so planet orbit, moon orbit, stellar orbit, and the right number for the outpost, so the ship knows where to go. If the ship is supposed to be supplying its resource to other spaceships, for example bringing in Vulcanite to ship out to the Iridium planet, then these belts should be connected down at the bottom and added to the bus. If that's not needed, these loaders at the top should be flipped round so you don't waste resources by putting them on a belt to nowhere. Next you set the filters on the loaders so that the main resource gets passed up to the station, and also set it as a very large negative number in the combinator so that it never gets fed to the disposal system. Speaking of the disposal system, there's a wire at the top that needs to be connected to the main circuit network in the spaceport to tell it to dispatch a train when there's lots of junk to be picked up. The main station needs an appropriate name as well so the trains know where to pick up the new resources from. All the relevant resource inputs at the bottom need to be hooked up. This ensures that the outpost will have everything it needs to make its products. Last but not least, set the clamp ID on the docking clamp so the spaceship knows where to land. That's quite a lot of things to set, but you can see how they're all either custom for the specific load the ship will be carrying, or they interface with the rest of the factory and so can't really be part of the blueprint. Once the Norbit spaceport is set up and configured, we can drop the spaceship blueprint in and then build the ship neatly inside the cutout that's been made for it. Building it here means it'll get fueled up automatically and loaded with everything our budding outpost needs. We also need to set the clamp ID in the combinator so the ship knows where to park. And after that step, we're done! One new spaceship fully configured and ready to fly off. If you ever want to add an additional ship to this route, you can just build another ship in the same parking space in exactly the same way and it'll be dispatched when it's ready. I also made a modified version of this ship that works in almost exactly the same way, except that it has a beam receiver and high temperature heat exchanger and turbine in the back instead of the solar panels. My objective here was to create a ship that could be used for deep space travel where there's no solar power while still fitting into the same docking space as the normal ships, and I'm very happy to say it just fitted. This design would mostly work in standard space exploration without Crastorio 2, however as I said earlier you would need to replace the superior long inserters with filter stack inserters and belts. You could still use exactly the same circuit conditions watching the inserters though, when the inserters outside the ship can't load, the logic is exactly the same. If you're using loaders on the other hand, it would have to be set slightly differently since you can't connect the circuit network to loaders. In that case, you'd need to connect the belts instead and read the contents of those to check when the ship was ready to leave. You also wouldn't be able to set dynamic filters on the loaders, and so would have to hard code what supplies the ship would carry into the loaders. This would potentially limit the number of different types of item you could carry, however, since there'll be multiple loaders coming out of each warehouse, you could have different loaders unloading different items, with the high throughput resources set on all of the loaders. We've done this in a few places for unloading trains, and it works, but you lose the flexibility of the inserter-based design. If you would like to try this design out, I shall be making the blueprints available for channel supporters, that is, anyone who's a Twitch subscriber, a YouTube member, or is donating on Ko-Fi. If you have any questions about it, please leave them in the comments or come along to one of our K2SE streams and I'll show you what the ships are doing in real time. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on the next video.